bring the meeting to order. Are there any changes or additions to the agenda as presented? I, I did receive an update from our attorney about the question about the cemetery stone that uh, someone had requested to move. Okay, you're gonna give us an update there. Anything else? Seeing none. Uh, I just have a couple of quick announcements. One is Friday night, we're gonna do another Zoom broadcast like we've done in the past, just to update the community on uh, where we're at with some of the uh, COVID-19 measures, some limited openings, what the rec committee's up to, et cetera. Uh, also just wanted to uh, mention if some of you happen to read Sue Lovering's uh, column this week, it was a very complimentary uh, note in there for Gordy and I. I. I can't speak for Gordy, but I don't know how Sue knew that I was about ready to run out in the woods screaming, but anyhow, that's what she said. Uh, but I wanted just to share that with the whole board, I think it's more of a demonstration of the board itself and where we've been at for this last few months. Uh, it's through the leadership of this whole board that we were able to tackle a lot of difficult issues. And I think it always was respectful and uh, we didn't always agree with everything that the board chose to do or not do. But I think in the end, uh, it, it shows uh, what true leadership there is in this board. And I'm very proud of the board. And I think that compliment should go to the board as a whole. For everyone on the Zoom uh, broadcast tonight, the first item we got up is interviewing a couple of operator positions for the Highway uh, Public Works Department. We will be going into executive session. It's anticipated that that will take about an hour. So we would not be back into open meeting until about eight o'clock. You're more than welcome to stay in the waiting room or tune back in about eight o'clock, uh, whatever is your pleasure. But with that, uh, I guess I would look for a motion from uh, one of the board members to enter into executive session for the interviewing of uh, public works employees. I'll move we enter into executive session to interview public works candidates as allowed by one VSA 313A3. Second. A motion is second, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? Show us in executive session at 704. At this point, I would entertain a motion for a uh, offer of employment. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we hire Mark LaHuya to fill the operator position for the Public Works Department after completion of the normal hiring procedures for new employees. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Do we have any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Congratulations, Mark. And you'll be sharing that news with him tomorrow, right? Yep, I'll be both in touch with both him and uh, after my conversation with Mark, I will try and get back to uh, our other applicants. Okay, so I think next up is update on our uh, yellow striping. I'm sure a few people would like to know that. Uh, do we want to do the yellow striping and the rest of my report, or do we want to get back to our regular order? Oh, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. I skipped over a bunch. Uh, yeah, we had to okay, is the, around a little bit. Uh, is, is the board prepared to approve the meeting minutes for September 8th, 21st, October 14th, and October 19th?
or does the board want to take them up one at a time? We were all here for him, weren't we? We missed sure. one. You I missed one? I forget which one it was. What's well, board's pleasure? I looked and I didn't find minutes for the 19th in, in my, uh, I looked at the found them. Do I have that one wrong? Maybe unmute Donna because she can help us out. Okay, I'll ask Donna to unmute. She just sent us something. So. Yeah, I just sent you the ones for September 8th, but it sounds like Doug might want something else to be added to those based on what he emailed me. But what's the one that you're asking about? The, the 19th, 19th of September? October. Oh, October. October. Well, I get, I've got them here on my computer. Um, do you, but you guys think you might not have gotten them? They might have come, but I didn't find them. Um, I was looking for them. Well, I can mail them out now if you want, but it probably doesn't give you time to review them, to approve them right now. Did, did the other people locate them, other board members? I don't recall. I'd have to go through my mail. Me too. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, we're clear on the 8th, 21st. The 8th and 21st of September and the 14th of October. It, it's so. a, Donna, even though I sent you another request on the 8th, I'm I'm happy just to go with the, with them as they stand. Okay. So I would entertain a motion if the board's prepared to approve the September 8th, 21st and October 14th. So move, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, do we have a second? I'll second that. I did note that there was a uh, note with that about NAP in September 8th. So which are, which are the three you're approving now? 8th of September, 21st of September, and October 14th. Okay. Nat, do you want to address Doug's thoughts? I'm and sorry, Donna, what are your thoughts, Doug? Well, Donna had sent out something that said that you had raised a question on the September 8th one. And you, I recall you you know, correcting a statement, um, and she reiterated that just tonight. Yeah, Don has reiterated that in her. So um, I would vote that with the change that Donna, that I noticed previously in that Donna emailed us this, this afternoon. Which set of meeting minutes was that? That was the eighth. That was the eighth. And I can reread it if I need to, but. Is there any other comments? We have a motion and a second to approve the September 8th, 21st and October 14th meeting minutes. Is there any other discussion? Yeah, I'm asking for a friendly amendment to that, I guess. A friendly amendment, which is? To include that on page six, it said it would be better reflected that Nat's oh. comments were Nat said the select board voted twice on raising the Okay. Twice, et cetera. And that's a friendly amendment. Is that friendly to the motioner and seconded? Fine with me. Also on page. Doug, were you the seconder? I don't know if I did it simultaneously or. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear it. It's, it's, it's okay with me. Okay. Go ahead, Nat. Uh, there was a, in that same email, Donna said, and Doug asked that on page six after Eric saying that he didn't know where Kyle was coming from, I added Kyle's response to that. Yeah, so I, and I just told her that's fine. Just leave it, leave it without what I had asked for expansion. Of. So no change there. No change there. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And I'm guessing Donna will send out October 19th meeting minutes for us for next meeting. And if Rosemary's on, you got the floor. All right, Rosemary just reconnected. So there you go, Rosemary. I don't have much for you guys tonight. Um, 
elections in Ireland. We've got about over 1,100 absentee ballot mail-in ballots to go through. I'm expecting maybe three, 400 people at the polls. Um, we have plenty of workers during the day and plenty at, um, we count ballots at night. Good. Anything else? No, I don't think so. Anybody got any questions for Rosemary? Mike? I, I miss a little bit of that. You said 1,100 uh, absentees and you thought maybe 400 would walk in tomorrow? Is that what you said? Yes. Okay. 2016 had almost 1,400 people. Wow. Oh. How many ballots did you mail out? Just about, about 2,000. Okay. Hmm. And I'm expecting quite a few uh, new registrations. So you think there's going to be 500 people short, even though you mailed out 2,000 of them? Yes. Oh, that's funny. You would think if everybody got a ballot, they'd have voted. Well, it's people's choice not to. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Anyone else? I have, some, I, I have a few questions. <clears throat> um, Rosemary, this is this is my first time doing the, the actual polls during the day. Um, and of course, being a, a pandemic here, what's what what are our <laughs> rules around folks showing up without masks, for example. Um, They'll be asked to evoke curbside. Okay, so will they be stopped at the door before they get upstairs? There's a sign saying, you know, mask required. And if they get upstairs, somebody will tell them they need to go downstairs. Okay, and that's somebody being the, the first, the intake people? Yes. Okay. And Kyle, there's a pile of masks in the lobby. Okay. So. And if someone refuses, then what? Then what's the next procedure? They'll be told to go downstairs, and I'll bring them a ballot. Okay. Okay. Um, and you'll be upstairs with us, Rosemary. Yes. Okay. Um. And I guess, yeah, I, I just had some questions about safety in general, just if... we got plenty of um, hand sanitizers and there's plexiglass on the intake okay. and the outtake um, checklist. Okay. Got, uh, face shields and masks and gloves. Okay. Okay. Um... Yeah, so, okay. So it just sounds like there'll be a lot of, of people for support around if we run into any sort of hostility. And we'll have um, pens at the, um, I've asked people to bring their own pen, but they don't have to bring their own pen. There'll be a couple of pens in the in checklist and they can drop them off at the out checklist and when people are done with them, we'll wash them down. Okay. Okay, thank you, great. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Rosemary. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, hey, get a good night's sleep tonight, Rosemary. Yeah, get ready for now. Uh, I'm guessing Charlie's here for the Planning Commission. Yep. Good evening, Charlie. As soon hey, as we get done. Unmute, Charlie. Am I unmuted now? Yes, you are. We can hear you. Very good, thank you. It's not eight fifteen. Okay, we're running ahead. Okay, so we've been looking at your class four roads, and we've read your letter, and except for going through your checklist of four or five items. We don't see that it's much different than what we've already submitted. So 
in an effort not to be doing this again, other than answering your checklist questions, which are <clears throat> road condition development, vehicular usage, recreational usage, access to unique features, streams, forest blocks, and natural communities. What else are you looking for us to do? Anybody got a recollection? Did, uh, did LCPC's uh, survey get to you? LCPC's, yes. Okay. And LCPC does their own thing. I, so does that indicate the roads that they, the class four roads that they, that does not, that are not hydrologically connected? Ask that again, Doug. The, it was my understanding that their, their survey was going to, and their report was going to indicate the roads that were not hydro, or the portion of class four roads that were not hydrologically connected. Yeah, so how is that relevant? Well, the hydrologically connected roads are ones that are, we will be under a burden to, to maintain. And the ones that are not hydrologically connected, the, uh, I don't think the standards are applicable to. Am I correct on that, Brian? You are correct. Uh, there is no, we have no new obligations or roads that are not hy hydrologically connected. And what would you like us to do with roads that are hydrologically connected? Well, we'd like your recommendation as to what we should do with them. And I suppose you could give us the recommendation whether it makes, uh, whether the burden that the state would pay, place on us for hydrologically connected roads uh, or non-hydrologically connected means that we should address them possibly differently. Or if there is no additional financial burden on us for non-hydrologically connected, do we leave them as is? Well, let me run this by you to see if it meets what you're looking for. We went up... Um... Basin Road, and we weren't concerned whether someone told us it was hydrologically connected or not, but we came to the conclusion that Basin Road cannot be um, reasonably maintained. That basically a lot of it is a ditch. It's got high banks on both sides of the roadbed, so it's a it's a culvert or a ditch and we would suggest that you convert that to a trail is that meeting your requirements well we you know i'm only one person you know i'm, I'm very interested in what you see the condition as and whether or not the uh, uh we need to you know we should consider that condition as and not look to the question of whether or not hydrologically connected should be a dominant in the consideration. That was our approach as we didn't, in considering the roads, we looked at their utility as opposed to their, um, um, high, the state telling us what we had to do with them. Mm -hmm. the, the, state the state keeps changing its mind on water. Yeah, the state isn't going to tell you what to, as present, the state is not presently telling us what we need to do if it's been deemed determined they're non hydrologically connected. And Brian, jump in if I'm incorrect on this. This has been quite a while since I looked at this. You, you are correct on that. Yeah, I specific, I mean, I remember the last time we talked about, like, that we said. We, we specifically sort of gave the, the, the marching order to to look at this piece. 
because that's what was missing before. We specifically kind of like, okay. That's my recollection, specifically kind of like. <laughs> In other words, we don't, I mean, if you want us to evaluate the hydrologically, we're not engineers. We're not highway engineers. Uh, Rob Moore is available to, to help you with that data. I mean, well, if it's in the report, if it's in his report, we can find it. But the roads have other uses besides whether they're hydrologically connected or not. We evaluated um, the importance to the community of the roads, as opposed to some bureaucratic criteria. I, just to jump in to back up Kyle on that, though, though yeah. we we're pretty specific on that. It wasn't sort of, it wasn't uh, ambiguous. Um, but anyway, the, also um, Kim's on the planning commission, and she's itching to yes, jump. She's yes. trying to. She's and, vice chair, and she's can certainly speak. Yeah, why don't we open up her mic as well, Brian? Okay, Kim, uh, if you can unmute yourself. I just wanted to clarify what you guys define as hydrologically. We're using the state standard, which uh, I don't remember the specific distance, but it's a, a distance to a, a water feature. It, it's a road segment within so many feet of a water feature. Okay, so we, we did talk about that. And I think what Charlie was alluding to is that there's some roads that even if they're affected by water, there isn't a solution to it. There isn't the possibility of uh, you know, putting millions of dollars in to try and create ditching on either side mm -hmm. of the road that doesn't have ditching. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's some roads that, that, and Sinclair I think is another one. Um, Basin and Sinclair both are very much what they are and to do something other than what they are would cost the town lots and lots of money. And what they are uh, would be fourth class. Not Sinclair, too. Prospect, Prospect, not Sinclair, Sinclair's a, Well, I've been on Sinclair enough to feel like it's very similar to Basin. But that's just me, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Mark, we have a, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. I, I was in talking about Sinclair above, uh, I don't know, what's that crossroad that intersects Rocky Sinclair? Road. Above Rocky, Sinclair above Rocky Road. Exactly, that's now, what I'm talking about, sorry. Yeah, that's we didn't look at that. that. We can look at that, we can add it, well, in the spring. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug. Um, I thought that, that uh, it was understood that LCPC had mapped the had mapped the non-hydrologically connected, had done it in segments of certain certain length, and we're, we're going to provide these, that information was going to be provided um, to, to- We have that report, Doug. Okay. And, you know, and, and so what, what you're, I, I haven't thought about the question of what to do with the dugways that uh, were that we have out there that we don't have that are not hydrologically connected that we have no obligation to maintain. You know, this this is kind of generated by the state rules on uh, on hydrologically connected sections that are fourth class roads for which we get no money but have an obligation to do something to. The other portion, we don't have an obligation. So I'm, you know, from my point of view, I don't know why we would turn them into trails when we don't have an obligation right now to, to do anything with them. And why we- You mean if there are any, let me see if I understand what you're saying, Doug. If it's a class four road that we don't have to do any hydrologically sensitive work to, you don't understand why we would convert it to a trail instead of leaving it as it is with no maintenance. Yeah, because you're gonna have a, you, you've changed the status, you know, but, but you're the planning commission, you can make a recommendation. I hadn't thought about it from this point of view, you know. Um, Which one? 
from your point of view of well, well, it's a crummy road, so let's just, just let's just lower our obligation. You know, you're not lowering your obligation because you don't have one, but maybe you want to change you want to change it, its status anyway. So I, I I just have never considered that. Yeah, we're, in all honesty, we're not looking at it the way you're looking at it at the yeah. moment. So neither of us considered. Never mind. Okay. Well, okay. I understand. You're you're looking at the utility of the road per se. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we kind of feel that a class four road ought to be a passable road. And if it's not passable and cannot economically be made passable, um, why call it a road when it's really just a trail? Kim, go ahead. My understanding was that we did have to maintain to a certain degree roads, class four roads that hadn't been turned into trails for the water part of it that we still like if a bridge washes out or if a culvert washes out and it's not a trail it's a class four road still we do have to maintain um that that's my understanding and i might have not understood it correctly i think that's correct that's correct i think kim is correct that would be our our thoughts on on bridges and culverts if we converted a road, if we recommended converting a road to a trail and there yeah. were bridges and culverts there, that the town would continue to maintain bridges and culverts in the trail if they exist as of the date of the of the conversion. Is that not correct, Kim? Is that what we kind of thought about? No. Doug, you don't want to do that, Mike. No, the, the main impetus for this whole thing in the beginning was try to save the town money down the road when the state gets really picky on all of this stuff for the water resources, uh, you know, because we realize that it's going to cost us a tremendous amount of money to maintain these class four roads when it gets to that part. So I was always on the assumption that we were trying to change as many class four roads to trails to reduce maintenance and save money for the town. And or maintain them to the uh, effect uh, uh, in creating policies that help the landowner maintain them to the point that there is less erosion, less um, at stake for the town to be pitching money that way. If we create a, a, a solid maintenance schedule where things are maintained, then we won't have the, the issues with erosion and water runoff if, uh, if uh, like it has been in the past. Yeah. Or that's my take on it again. Yeah, kind of mine too, Kim. Yeah. But the, the main deal is to, to save us money because this is gonna possibly kill us down the road. Yeah, the place where you save money is hydrologically connected. There's no money, uh, especially if you're going to on trails Keep the keep the bridges and culverts and maintain those. I think that that uh, that changing to trails is a prescription for uh, that that will send these uh, will not be as likely to save these rights of way and allow them to be you know rehabilitated down the road. You know it, it's giving up on our future. So you want to keep. Things the way they are. If if this uh, if the state hadn't passed this rule that required us to deal with hydrologically connected, uh, I still think we should look at fourth class roads. But we wouldn't be looking at it. You know, we'd be looking at it uh, differently. This is an economic, like Mike says, this is an economically driven. And it, the economically driven decision is is relates to hydrologically connected. The standards are the same. I'm not saying that I, I don't know what to that. I think the state should change their rule. I, I think if you look at the recommendations that the planning commission had put through, and you'll see that the, the places where we turned 
class four roads into trails were places where either they will be kept as tr as uh, a viable public entry passageways because they're used and or they won't be because they're not used. I don't think that if you look through the recommendations that we made, I don't think you'll see places that we turned into a trail um, that were needed as roads and we tried not to turn anything into a trail that that was um, accessing somebody's property that used it with vehicles. Well, I thought, as I recall, it's been quite some time since I looked at the first report, but I thought, thought the mark was missed substantially. And I think that, uh, um, you know. In what way, Doug? Uh, well, I, I read the report and I thought, oh my goodness. And then I realized I, th this is better than I expected. Then I saw the second half of the other part of it and I thought, oh my God, I thought we said no to this. You know, I'd have to go over. To and, what? It looked, I'd have to go over and, and look at the parts of the report, which is why I thought we redirected you to, you know, check check the how Roger thing connected because that's where the that's where the money is. I personally, we have a long standing policy of trying to maintain rights of way, you know, in their current status and not abandon them. Uh, and that's what I see I, I, and not change their classification. And, uh, you know, I see this as a wholesale rewriting of, of our, our road policy. Now, maybe we should do that, you know, and, and we should read your report again and, and, and study it. But, you know, I wasn't very pleased. You know, it didn't meet my expectation last time. Uh, I, you know, when you come to places that are significant, what are you gonna do with the Gomo place? Which is truly a significant place. And uh, what are you gonna do with natural areas? You know, uh, um, certain things, you know, I, I didn't hear or see anything with regard to environmental uh, uh, components and large blocks of timberland and things like that in, in your report. I got that. We got that in your in your letter and I told you at the beginning we were going to address that before we make our next submission. Okay. But I'm reading your letter. I'm reading the letter of March 22nd. And you got all kinds of criteria in it. Some are the economic issues of the hydrologically connected, but then you're concerned about mortgage holders and re, re, uh, property values and things like that. So we tried to balance those. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so to be looking at it from only the cost of the hydrologically con of complying with hydrologically connected requirements. We tried to balance that with the, our obligation to the property owners that are serviced by that road. Mm -hmm. My last plug, and, and that is that the, the policy that we set forward was done with a few actual landholders that came in, class four road holders, who I learned a lot from and who I think guided us to some really good things. If you look at what was, there's a lot of people who have to pay money according to what was, I don't know if they still do, to, to just plow the road. That there, it's a very backwards policy what has been. It hasn't allowed landholders to go in and actually maintain their roads because there's bondages, bonds, and all sorts of things that they have to jump through hoops in order to do that. And there's good reasons why. I know they can screw up the road, but I, I feel like the policy that we put forward helped get the pitch in the, you know, land, road and landholders that had roads, class four roads going through had more ability to, to be able to help maintain their roads. And if the town actually set, I, you know, Doug, you're saying that there's, there, that's been happening and it seems like it was in the past and then it kind of fell away and it really hasn't, there hasn't been a schedule and a format to be able to maintain those class four roads in a way that will save the town money. Yeah, I don't think that, I think that the completely absent a good maintenance policy 
you know, about who can plow, how much work can you do, things like that. We worked on that. Um, and, you know, like I have neighbors that live on a class four road. I actually have access to a class four road. Should I choose to, to put my driveway on that? Um, I, I, you know, it, as you alluded to, you know, it's not their road, it's the town road, which you talked about permission. It, it's, a, it's a sticky wicket. Mortgage holders are, you know, the person on a class four road, people next to me had real great difficulty in obtaining mortgages you know, if they'd had a shared right of way with a private uh, road association, it'd been easy. They have better access. It's a town road, and they had to jump through all sorts of hoops. We just don't want to make that more difficult with the people at Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. You know, that that maybe is, you know, something that you that, that the planning commission isn't familiar with. But uh, being on a class four road can be a problem as far as securing a mortgage, running it through there. Um, the, I think the policy, a good policy that allows the, you know, without cost, uh, the landowner to access it and, and maintain roads to plow roads is, is necessary. But I see that as separate from the road classification. Yes, I agree, but it does tie in. Well, it's not separate from the classification. Class one two, or class two and three are maintained by the town in good shape. Class four is not maintained at all. So yeah, if, the, if it's a, if it's a, the classification is all important for road maintenance. Yeah, I agree. You, you, if it's a class four road, you know, I don't think you should name it a class four road versus a trail based on the, uh, you know, the absence of a, a clear policy for landowners to, uh, uh, so they know exactly what rights they are and they could trot it out to a more to a mortgage company and say, look, it's a class four road. This is what I can do. I'm guaranteed access and I'm guaranteed the ability to to improve it and maintain it. And so you access is provided. That's what the mortgage holder is. Well, that's what we did in the in the draft of uh, February 11th. Yeah. We said that the property owners. I thought what you did in that draft was uh, provide uh, uh, access for people that are existing and not for other people down the road. That's correct. That is correct. If that, I, if there's, yes. If I remember correctly, are, some of the recommendation was increase maintenance by the town of some of these class four highways that are currently uh, residents on. You're both correct. Yes. And what I think Doug that, is alluding to is that we talked about changing from a road to a trail at the last driveway. And Doug's talking about, well, what about future driveways? We did not, we didn't consider future driveways because we wanted to make as many trails, as many roads into trails to save you guys non-money. Because you do spend some money on, you're supposed to spend some money on class four roads. It's in the budgets. Um, and if you look at what roads we turned into trails that are, are recommended, they're like state land. It was private property. There, it wasn't. It, I'll go back. And look. I don't think we did that to any roads that. Well, I'll, I'll, yeah, we did. Yeah, we did, Kim. <laughs> I'm, Connie Hall. I'm looking at it right now. I'm looking. Doug is correct. Doug is correct. I also thought in, in Eric had questions. You know where you had. You, uh, uh, we have a fourth class road going to a state to a state and Eric asked the question it's our it's our right away we don't have any obligation to give it up why why would we give it up why would we give up access to the you know the you're not really giving it up but yes you have to, you're gonna have to pull it back in with a different in a different framework and and procedure is hard you're you're, you're we can we talked about in our report, in our recommendations, it was to discontinue, uh, throw up the uh, portion of the road slash trail on state property. We reconsidered that and we don't wanna do that. We wanna keep the trail because we don't have to do anything to it and we preserve our right of way. Mm -hmm. So yes, Doug, we we're aware of that and we wanna make that change. This, this is a hard discussion because it's you're really testing my memory. You know? Yeah, and my uh, moving forward, if we could have 
more regular updates maybe so we don't have to um <laughs> well, put us on the agenda and we'll appear okay yeah, I, I think probably the whole board needs to review that uh original uh recommendation because like doug said the memories are a little fuzzy right now that's fine i believe you have it all if not i can yep. get you more copy. mike I appreciate all the hard work uh, you folks have been doing on this for uh, the select board and the town. And I certainly hope that you do not get discouraged and think that we're trying to throw a wrench in the works every so often, but I think we're all committed to try to get the best product for the town with the least amount of outlay for town monies. And I certainly wanna say again, thank you very much for everything you've been doing for us. Brian, so can, we're I'm while gonna we're ask Brian about, if you could share their proposal from last February to the full board and we'll take it up at a future time. Nat? Yeah, um, the other thing, and uh, Charles, you might have mentioned this early on, I, and I didn't catch it, but um, Diana Osborne had also um, sent in some really specific details, I thought good feedback that um, I think we asked the, the planning commission to at least uh, Yes. So I don't know if you if that's been part of the agenda. We have, we have. Uh, I've made copies of her letters for all members, and we will discuss it. I don't know if everyone's had a chance to read it yet or not. Great. But yes, we all we're all in possession of copies. One thing I want to mention that in our surveys, we would like to suggest that a part of a class four road be upgraded to class three. We're also aware, of, although it's not our assignment, and uh, there are several class three roads that are really just driveways and should you should consider in the interest of economy, reclassifying those driveways to class four. Three in particular, two off um, Footbrook and one off Plot Road. Oh, um, you're singing to Mike Dunham's choir. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is great. Thanks, Charlie. Well, you didn't formally ask us to do that. Yeah. But you've been reading Actually, my mind. One of, the, one of the landowners wants it reclassified from three to four. Kim? I don't know. One Kim, of the others it? does not. And Kim? I don't know about the Go theory. ahead, Kim. I would just make one request that it sounds like um, Doug and possibly other folks on the select board have some great ideas and that um, planning commission meetings are totally open and we love the input. And if you you have ideas right there, um, come to our meeting and give them and help, um, you know, give the input that you are looking for, maybe help guide us instead of um, like, it's, Washing down on what we've done. So come. <laughs> no red pencil corrections. It'd be better to be involved. Huh? Um, Either way. Yeah, well, be, I, I, it's, be, it's, a, it's a good suggestion, Kim. You. you should be advised that we meet in person. Oh. <laughs> and Doug won't show up then. Socially distanced with Matt. You know, outside. Our last three outside. Our so last Brian, three meetings were outside on the roads. Brian, next meeting. We'll, Brian will share your last proposal with the full board so we can uh, maybe uh, get ourselves reset back to where our original thoughts were, our concerns with their original proposal. And then we could have a better discussion, I think. If, I'm curious. Charles, if there are things that aren't in the February that you've since changed that you could summarize, that might be useful. I'll send Brian an email. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Charlie uh, and Kim. We're meeting. Next Thank you very week. much. Appreciate it. Well, I'm not done. Oh, go ahead. Oh. So we'll put class four roads aside for now, but some things that are coming up are uh, the Act 250 revisions. They want to, um, there are, I think the state's unaware that most of our, down, our designated downtown floods 
Also, uh, we need to start, or we should be thinking about retail marijuana. I know it's not gonna happen tomorrow, but it's gonna be coming up. And it seems to me that the planning commission is a natural place to start the discussion of, of siting retail marijuana facilities. And finally, the posting of the warnings for the planning commission meetings. The current policy, as I understand it, is that the town will print the warning and post it at the town village place of business, but that a committee member has to come pick up a copy and take it to the post office and post it. And that especially with uh, social distancing, that's uh, creates another point of contact currently. It's also in general a pain in the ass. Uh, village people go, village and town people go to the post office daily. I don't see that it would be very burdensome to have them post one more notice, but I could be wrong. Thoughts, Brian? So I would like Charles is correct on, on the current policy. Um, you know, that the uh, town employees post notices at the municipal building and online and that's it. Uh, so uh, they need to be posted in addition to that, at least at the uh, uh, Bolton board at Sterling Market. Um, but yeah, our, our, we do have town employees going to the post office pretty much daily. Um, if we, you know, we could say the town employees, you know, if we're going to ask that duty to be taken over by town employees, I would recommend that we add the caveat that the agenda has to be received uh, before 11 o'clock. Because uh, that's about the time that we normally make our postal run. Okay. I mean, that seems like a a reasonable request in uh, both ways. Have it before 11 o'clock. And if we're going to the post office anyhow, put up a couple of notices. It's pushback. I'll do it myself for you. Yeah, we know Mike hangs out at the post office. Oh, yeah, I'm there all the time. Okay. Holding court. Okay, anything else, Charlie? Nope, that's pretty much it. You got anything for us? Well, not right now, but thank you for making, making it lively meeting tonight. Have a good Thanksgiving. Quick, quick. Thank if I could, to you, folks. To go ahead, Matt. Jump in real quick. I think Charlie makes a great point about the marijuana commercial uh, sales. Uh, retail sales and that that's really something that's coming at us like a freight train and, and uh, we should do it. Um, if it. If it happens in Johnson, we should uh, do it with uh, some deliberate intention instead of just letting it happen to us. That's all. Agree. Okay. Eric. Yeah, Eric. Mike. Uh, that marijuana business is still going to come down to a town having the ability to opt in or opt out, correct? I don't remember how it ended. Do you know, Brian? Not off the top of my head. I, I'd want to. I think that was still in the bill. Well, in one chamber, it was. Opt in. You have to opt in. Okay. I believe okay. so. So, same difference opt in, opt out. If you don't opt in, you've opt out. One other thing, if I can, uh, Charlie, does the first Monday of the month work well for you to give a planning commission report? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think we can plan on uh, our first Monday meeting hearing from the planning commission if, if you know, you, you'll be available next month. Yes. Great. Perfect. Okay. We'll try and get back into that routine. So thank you. Right. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Charlie. Uh, Thanks, Charlie. You're welcome. Bye, folks. Nice. So I think now you're going to give the update on the striping. Yeah. So the uh, 
a lot a lot of uh well kind of already went out a lot of the information that we have on this already went out but the state contracts with uh in this case it was ld safety marking to do uh road painting the the center lines and the fog lines and in this case uh ld safety marking made the decision early last thursday morning that uh they did not think that the uh, rainstorm would be coming this far north. So they painted uh, in Johnson, in Cambridge, in Hyde Park, Waterville, uh, and I've heard about a couple other towns that might also have been painted uh, the same day. It, I'm not aware of there being anything off in their formulation, but it definitely was, uh, you know, in poor condition and didn't stick to the road uh, at all. Uh, so as soon as the rain came in, it all washed out and uh, we kind of throughout the day, I worked to kind of track back and find out what the company was that was responsible for this. When I, I made contact with them, uh, we started working on mitigation efforts and we eventually were able to uh, get out and put sand on the roads to soak up what was left of the paint material. But a lot of the paint did uh, wash off the roads into uh, catch basins uh, and into the, the waterways. Um, at the same time, I've been coordinating with Vermont uh, Department of Environmental Conservation uh, and their water quality resource expert, um, who is pursuing uh, action with the same with, with LD safety marking for their uh, river contamination in this case. Um, so that's that's ongoing about cleaning up the river and what the penalties will be for uh, causing the spill. Mm -hmm. Locally, uh, they have agreed uh, that they're going to reimburse for damages and they're reimbursing the town for our time uh, where we were helping spread sand. Um, after we came to all those arrangements, Thursday night into Friday morning, after spreading the sand, they were cleaned out. They cleaned out uh, catch basins for the uh, village stormwater system um, and cleaned up all of the, the sand that we, we could locate and all, all of the paint that we could. Um, so ongoing, we're looking for uh, reports made to uh, Clint Relation at LD Safety Marking um, for reports on any lingering issues, whether it's paint on a car, paint on property. Uh, if you've got a, you know, kind of puddle or pooling of paint on your property, anything like that, uh, we want to make contact with them for, for the cleanup issues. Um, and yeah, the penalties are gonna be assessed by DEC for that. Um, what it means for us for paint marking will be that we're coming back to it in the spring. Um, I don't think any attempt is going to be made uh, for the remainder of what fall we have before uh, you know winter fully sets in. I, I don't think it's gonna be worth it trying to make the time to, to get that set. Uh, so I'm not planning on it, but they do make those calls uh, without local consultation. Matt? Yeah, well, maybe you just answered the question, but it, it, it seems like even if it went well, painting the roads at the last day of October is kind of foolish because it's just going to get scraped off by the snow plows over the winter. Yes. And I, 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 I don't know if we can have any influence over getting that done earlier in the year. We'll, we're going to speak to uh, the VTRANS about this, about, you know, that we really don't think these are good use of funds, that uh, applying new paint that late in the year. Um, yeah, I, I spoke to Eric about it that morning before it started to rain, and we were commenting that this was a, even if it didn't wash away, this was a bad time to go out and paint. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, it was about to get covered by snow and scraped up by snow plows. Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was a poor use of resources, even if it had gone well. Um, what else is known? No, they, they, there, there is no local consultation on this. I wasn't expecting to, for them to paint uh, for the remainder of the year. Uh, I was surprised by it, but yeah, they, they must have had something in their contract that made it worth it for them to come out and do the paint anyway. You were really on top of it Friday, so, so thank you for that. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, that really was a lot of trouble for, for everybody on Thursday, and uh, I'm really sympathetic for everybody who had their cars and other things marked up by, by that. Uh, are there any questions? That's really kind of the, the summary. Are there any questions from the public on this? All right. I don't see anybody shaking their, waving their hand. Okay, thank you, Brian. I'm sure there'll be more on that later. Uh, options on updating the website? Yep. So you saw a markup of what uh, one suggestion that we could pursue for uh, Town of Johnson. If anybody else in the public is interested, it's uh, toj.websitevalley.com. Um, it's one option uh, that it was marked up by our website administrator, Grant Harper uh, of Website Valley. I gave him, I got a little bit of feedback that I sent on to him, but I asked him not to make any updates to it until we got confirmation about whether we were uh, interested in, you know, paying the money to, to put him to work, actually creating a new website. This was really just a, a kind of proof of concept of something that, it, how it might look. Um, if we're interested, it would be about, Twelve hundred dollars uh, for a new website of similar size to the the one we have now. Did everyone have an opportunity to look at that? Yeah. Um, respectfully, I I wasn't impressed with it at all. I I thought I know that it's just sort of a mock up, but um, I was yeah. Personally, I think that our current website is functioning, <laughs> functioning better than than what I'm seeing right now. I mean, I, I definitely think we need to upgrade our website. I'm just not, from what I'm seeing, I'm not convinced that this is the person for the job. I mean, when you're doing a website, you've just got to have so much attention to detail and have an aesthetic eye and and um, and and make our town look like somewhere you want to move to. <laughs> um, and I'm just not, it's, those aren't the, the feelings that the current mock-up is evoking in me. So. Um. Uh, to be fair to Grant, I did tell him not to adopt any of our current, our, our feedback. And I did send him the feedback that you had, Kyle, but I asked him not to do that because I wanted us to at least express a little more interest in whether we wanted, I, I didn't feel good about how much time he might spend and then we still might decide we don't want to spend the money. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, didn't his, when we hired him, his um, pr proposal was that he would do an hour of web content or something like that? Yeah, we get an hour, uh, we, we get an hour of content time. Uh, I forget the period, uh, if it's per contract or per month. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd have to look at that. Okay. Yeah, I just, I guess I just feel strongly that if we're gonna spend the time and money to redo it, it should be, you know, um, really sharp and really, yeah, just really shows our, our best self. <laughs> Anybody else have an opportunity to look at it and have thoughts? 
Does so everybody less think about that our this current one specifically, but are we interested in pursuing something like this in general or not? Brian, Is you there... know what program he was using? Was he using a Squarespace or a... I believe he was doing using WordPress. Okay. Yeah, so there's a lot more options with WordPress versus Squarespace. Squarespace is a little bit more plug and play and WordPress, there's more nuance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do have quite a, quite a few options for how we would handle it uh, over the long run. Um, is, is there anyone who thinks that our current website is sufficient or needs a dust off and Needs a dust off. Yeah, it definitely needs a dust off. I'm not a, it's not really my wheelhouse to be able to give specific feedback, but the current site is dated for sure. To say that well, the best. It's more about should I engage with him in this? Should we spend the money on this or do we want to spend the money? I think we're also going to have to consult with the village on this because the village also uses our website and uh, pays for a share of its hosting costs and everything else. Yeah, I personally think it's money very well sp spent if 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 we're getting the pro you know the results that that we want. I mean, this is this is so many things. It's it's a place for our current you know residents to get information easily and efficiently, but it's also economic development. Um, that we so desperately need to attract new families and new folks to, and businesses and whatnot. So I think it's a it's a really important thing. I guess I would like, does he have examples of like finished work that he's done? Does he have websites that he's done for other towns or? Uh, he does the- Personal people or like- He's done the Johnson Historical Society website. All right, uh, okay. And we can get a couple more examples from him, but um, so it sounds like we want we do want to pursue something like this. I think that's sort of the consensus. Yes. Okay. Are there anyone else that anybody knows who does this kind of work? I uh, I just don't know anyone that's done a municipal one before. I don't know if that's a specific skill set or not. Um, Didn't we just go through this process to hire this guy? He hired him specifically for his maintenance. Okay, I got it. Thank you. He also can be our designer. But okay. we could well, hire a different designer and have him continue to provide maintenance. But they're really not the same then, no, yeah. no, not gotcha. necessarily. Well, uh, Brian, could you get uh, some of the sites that, that they have done or he yeah. has done and send them to us? Yeah, Somebody. why don't I collect a couple examples and we'll do it. But the biggest thing for me was I didn't want to go so far out on a limb. So if we're interested in pursuing this, I'll, 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 I'll gather a little bit more information and uh, see if you maybe on a single page can start to incorporate some of the suggestions that we had for him. Sounds does good. The, does, Go the league, does the League of Cities and Towns have any suggestions? Do they, do they have anybody that reviews or sees that? Can they tell us here's a really terrific website, you know? They could, I'm sure we could ask them for an assessment on are we failing to meet any legal obligations? But I think they would probably steer away from telling us whether we had a good website or not. Um, well, I'm wondering. I'm wondering if they could. You could get somebody to say, "Well, here's a terrific website." You know, what? What? Who has the? You know, what communities have terrific websites? Right. I can ask on. Uh, I think probably the best way to gather that would be. I can ask on the municipal mailing list, you know, who's happy with their website and we can go from there. I know our website should now be loading much faster. Uh, and it was when I uploaded our board pack, it was a lot easier than uploading a board pack at the last meeting. 
Um, but yeah, so I, I'm gonna gather some more information from him. Uh, I'll see what I can do about finding other comparable websites and, and try and provide a little more comprehensive, but it sounds like we're interested in spending a little bit of time on this, so. Yeah, web uh, website, uh, websites are the intros to so many things now that, that, that you really want a good one, you know? It, it's like, yeah. Um, yeah. but they're completely out, like Nat is saying for him, they're completely outside of anything I know anything about. So I defer to Kyle and, and her aesthetic suggestions and things like that. Yep. Um, Brian, did, did I in my email send you some examples of, because I did, it. yeah, okay. Like, yeah. Um, I think Newport has a pretty fantastic looking one. There's some things that I don't really like about it, but just as initial sort of like, yeah. Um, clicking on it, you're like, woo, this is, this looks like a cool place. Um, so, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the other part of this is that just because I'm on doing my second one right now, it's so much handholding and tinkering and feed. I mean, it's a time suck, let me tell you. <laughs> I yeah. mean, for all the right reasons in the end, but it's, it's, it's a huge endeavor. I just want <clears throat> to. Yep. And, and yeah, I didn't want to get involved in this without a little bit more direction from the board that you wanted. You wanted this. Yeah. That I mean, honestly, that kind of worries me because I feel like we are so behind on quite a lot of projects. Um, just hearing hearing time suck. I, I'm just saying it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't all. say that because I don't think it's important. I'm just saying that's the reality. Is that it's many, many. Yeah. Years. No, you're. <laughs> It's, it's good because you have that experience and the rest of us don't. So I think that's good. You know who would be on the committee. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we'll see some examples and maybe you can get some feedback from the league. And, um, yeah. Okay. All right. I mean, maybe we can just do a few minutes every meeting on this and uh, not or devote a special meeting at some point if we have to, but. Yep, we'll see about getting some updates on it yep. in the future. All right, uh, next up, the ice rink to Old Mill Park. Uh, the last location for the ice rink was at Legion Field. It's not a, uh, it's not really gonna be available to us while we're sharing space with, um, but while we're sharing that space with the elementary school, uh, they would like to leave up the snow fence uh, for the course of the winter, uh, which cuts right through the middle of where the ice rink would be. Um, one possible alternative location would be Old Mill Park. We've been plowing access to Old Mill Park for the snowmobile club in the past. We can continue to do that. Um, it will be a, possibly even easier for us to provide some of the basic snow clearing with equipment uh, at Old Mill Park than it was at Legion Field where we had to be careful about, um, you know, there was the, the water line up to the uh, Travis Hill residence uh, that had frozen one year. So we were always a little careful about that. Uh, every year since then. Um, so it, that's kind of our suggested alternative location. Um, there's talk about possibly on the Village Green, but the Village Green doesn't have great access to it either. Um, and there isn't a lot of room there and the Village is working on a few other projects on the Green. So they're leaning away from uh, granting that space for the ice rink. So my recommendation is that we try and do it at Old Mill Park. The downsides to that that I'm aware of is we benefited greatly by having, um, you know, Brian and uh, other individuals who were located right across the street and were interested in doing a lot of the maintenance work on, on the ice rink. Uh, the other thing is if we're using heavier equipment, we're probably not gonna be able to use boards uh, or we have to at least be a lot more careful with how we use boards uh, on the border for the ice rink. 
Um, but I think that we have support there and uh, we'll have to ask the village officially, but I've, I'm led to understand that the fire department is interested in assisting in this and providing water to that location that they would also support Old Mill Park as a new location. So uh, what's the board's pleasure? Are we interested in uh, trying to relocate the ice rink to Old Mill Park? What's our, um, what's the agreement with the school that we have? It's a, it's a little informal, but it is that uh, they did not have enough outdoor space to provide a recess area for all their students and distancing. Mm -hmm. um, and they asked for assistance with more space. And we agreed that they could use part of Legion Field. Um, and so, so we've roped it off. I think Lisa would like to speak. Lisa's here. I just had um, just a few key points. The first is if this happened, it would um, be a temporary move through just hopefully this year. Um, and then speak, you know, if the school needs the space even next fall for outdoor classroom space, coming to better terms with them about keeping the ice rink space available once it got cold enough that the kids could be indoors or would be indoors. Um, and there is still a little bit of discussion going between the JAS just, um, I think it's nice to have it downtown. So this is, um, this is the start of a discussion for if we really can't get that fence moved, um, is, would it be okay to use Old Mill Park for this winter? But I think ultimately people really like it on Legion Field. It works well on Legion Field with the pizza oven. It's a lot more accessible. It has better light. It has better water access. So this is a temporary one winter solution to otherwise just not having one. Any other thoughts? I think Brian would like to yeah. pipe in. Hey, uh, yeah, I think that the ice rink this year is probably more important than any other year we've had it and accessibility to it is probably the most important thing. Also the accessibility to water because the fire department, you know, they do, they do lend a hand, but, um, I don't know if you ever drove by at about 9.30 any night last winter I was out there. You know, it takes a lot of water from the hydrant. I don't see it working out at Mill Park without access to water. If you want to dig a fire hydrant out there, sure, we can do it at Mill Park. But if we're just relying on one dump load every Thursday, you know, that's wishful thinking. We don't know what's going to happen Thursday morning or Friday morning. You know, it's just, it's, it's not going to work out. Um, we don't need a lot of space on Legion Field. We just got to move that fence 25 feet, 20 feet, not even the full length of it. And we clear paths over to the pizza oven and, you know, keep it nice and cleared out. And I think it would provide more space. Have the kids shovel it during the day, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Good not? luck. Good luck with that. Well, That's kind of why I asked what the agreement with the school is because I, it almost seems like such a missed opportunity. Like, couldn't right. they incorporate it into their outdoor activity? I mean, my sure. daughter, I mean, she gets, she's like, it's really, there's, there's nothing dynamic right now outside to play on or with because they can't be on the structures and, you know, they just have an open right. field. There's not even any sticks or stones. <laughs> so, it doesn't seem helpful to not put it there. It seems counterintuitive to move it right now. It doesn't seem like the right idea. Let's yeah. you know, make it harder for everybody involved putting it together and then move it away from the people that need it. Uh, it's, it seems pretty silly. So I think we just got to call the shots on this one and just do it, you know? Yeah. Well, Lisa, you've been in contact with the school, right? Because I think they were pretty adamant on uh, not wanting to move the fence. They correct? seem really committed to the use of not so much that they didn't want the trouble to move the space because we offered to do that for them. It was the commitment to the use that they're using the space. Um, and Mr. Manning, who's the principal there is currently out. Um, he's out on a leave right now. And so 
um, you know, kind of work around talking to others. And so maybe, um, you know, we're trying to get in touch with him directly and just see about how much use once it gets really cold is that area going to get and is it um would it make sense to move the fence over a little do the rink and then when spring comes clean the fence up you know as soon as as soon as we can the rink up as soon as we can and put the fence back for them um so it's still a little bit of a work in progress i think we wanted permissions to old mill park on the just so that if it doesn't work down there we can start the planning for it right away without waiting for another month to get to a select board meeting. So I think that's the question to the board is if it cannot work out at the Legion field, would we entertain allowing it to ice skating rink to be at the mill house, uh, mill field or not have one this year? I guess that's where we're sort of at. Mike? I, I don't think we should ever mess with the volunteers. If you have <laughs> a, a bunch of people that are interested in volunteering and uh, they want it on Legion Field, I think that we should do everything possible to make that happen. And uh, the last I knew, the school does not dictate to us what to do, do they? No. Okay, so we can make a decision on our own. I, I say we, uh, we leave it the way it is uh, and let those who who volunteer uh, to do this good work for the town and the village uh, to make their own borders and to get by it with what they need to have an adequate skating rink. And we should move forward and have it where it's always been. What's the rest of the board's thoughts? Go ahead. Right. Go ahead, Connie. No, 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 I was saying, go ahead to you, and then I'll say something. I, I'm wondering what uh, space, you know, our uh, COVID-19 committee thinks that, uh, or how you would evaluate a skating rink. I know it's outside. Uh, there's a certain amount of gathering there. Um, I wonder how you would evaluate that, how much space you would think it needs. Uh, I think that uh, whereas the school can't tell us what to do, uh, we we ought to have strongly in mind what the, the importance of whatever program they have and what the, what they need. Um, so I, I think that that you know if the school actually needs this space, we probably ought to say, yeah, you know we'll, we'll move this uh, move this rink. Uh, if they can if they don't need this space and and it can work out within the COVID-19 protocols, that's the ideal place. But I don't think we should ignore the fact that we have COVID-19 and, uh, and, and, and uh, the distress that causes people and the disruption. Well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think we should be, in, you know, not, I think we should try to work together as much as we can on this, but um, I also sometimes feel like sometimes there, uh, sometimes people also don't know what's necessary, you know, what uh, thinking about thinking about the community as a whole and what what also the community's needs are um, in terms of things to do, outdoor recreation that can be safe. And I, I was just thinking, I think skating might be one of the safest things. I mean, you have your own skates, you're not really touching anyone. Um, so I'm, I'm feeling like, yeah, we, we uh, I'm feeling pretty strongly that we need to make this happen in a space that's accessible and both to the community and to our volunteers. I think that's just a really, really important thing right now. And if we can do that, that, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't impede what this, you know, school needs to do, then, then great. And I hope we can. Mike? I think we should just call it a skating protest and then we can do whatever we want to do over there. That? Well, they're all really good points that have been made so far, except for the ridiculous thing Mike just said, but um, <laughs> the, uh, 
Uh, it was all a jest. I mean, I didn't realize I was going to trigger you in that. <laughs> pushing back at you, Mike. That's all. So, um, so um, I do. I, I, I also want to really be aware that, first of all, I want to say what Brian has done down there, what he did last year was absolutely fantastic. It was really beautiful ice. And, and uh, I don't want to do anything to upset that. Um, I also want to be really aware that the school and the education system is under an awful lot of pressure. Uh, and we really need to accommodate the school as well and the, the kids at recess and whatever else. I, I have a hard time believing that they're going to need that whole park and they're even going to have access to it because there's going to be three, four feet of snow out there. It's going to be taller than most kids that they would actually need all of that space. So I think we should push them harder on really trying to come up with a compromise here that works for us both. And I also think Mark Nielsen is, is our school board member who's really responsive to these sorts of things in the past when I've talked to him about it. He's really been helpful in helping to, uh, to come to uh, agreement with the community um, on these sorts of issues. I know that's wicked wishy-washy. I mean, if we're forced into it, I don't know. It should be at, no, it should be at uh, Legion. I think I'm hearing a consensus from the board keeping it on the Legion if it's at all possible. So I think we're probably gonna send Lisa with those instructions, push back a little bit on the school, see why we can't make this work for both. I'd be happy to lay it out with them too and maybe put some stakes in the ground so we could see it and get a visual, if that helps. That might be helpful. Okay, I think- we we'll try to so get to that this weekend or next if- Okay. Just, or just what the dimensions are that you that you need. I mean, you've got a rectangle. Yeah, I can't remember what, what was it, Lisa. Was it fifty by ninety, forty by ninety? <laughs> Actually, if you can get that to Lisa, she can use that when she talks to the school. I believe I have it in an email from last year, Brian. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Yeah, it's about right for three on three. <laughs> yeah, uh, but Brian, the liner think... was the liner was bigger than that, so we could. With the idea of COVID in mind, if if we can access the space, we might even try to increase the dimensions a little, if possible. Um, increase the space for people to skate and spread out. Brian, I think Sophia would like to say something. Oh yeah, no, I, I think I'm unmuted. Um, I was just gonna say like, as far as the requirements for space and stuff on the field, like they have the fence just in a straight line, but if they need space, like couldn't it bump out to accommodate the ice rink and then towards the sidewalk to make up that space, you know, like if they need, cause I, I mean, I fully support it being on the Legion field for sure. And like with the oven and what we do with the, um, the community oven committee, like the skate and bakes and stuff, I think it's great. Um, but yeah, if, if we could just, I guess, yeah, get the space that's needed for the ice rink and the space that's needed for the school and see, I mean, it's a huge chunk of property and there's more space that's beyond the fence that could be utilized. So I just think that it should be able to work for everybody. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll check in with them. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Okay. Thank you all concerned here. And thanks for the volunteers for Yes. Everything you do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Transportation Advisory Committee. Yep, uh, Lamo County Planning Commission Transportation Advisory Committee appointments are due. Uh, we have Duncan Hastings appointed to the Lamo County Planning Commission. Uh, would we like to reappoint him? What's the board's pleasure? i move. You want to move the slate? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, then the slate is myself to the Transportation Advisory Committee. We usually have an alternate to that, right? And he just left? Yeah. Uh, my recommendation on that is to wait till we get a replacement for our public works supervi supervisor. Right on. Is there a motion to uh, point the slate? 
think I did. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. second. Got a second. Any other discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? Congratulations. Fast access. Uh, Vast is, ac is requesting access to uh, roads and uh, municipal property, same as they have for the last several years. There are no changes to the access they're asking for. Okay. Does Bobby want to add anything further? If no, there's no changes. What's the board's pleasure? No move. Looks like Bobby's trying to talk. Oh, she is. You're muted, Bobby. <laughs> You'll have to unmute if you want to. Here we go. Um, asking. Let's see. Yeah, asking for reg regular access that we've always accessed. Also, um, we just fixed one of the bridges in the town forest that is next to what was Catalonia's camp. And I'm asking if either Brian Story or um, Eric can sign off on an agreement with Bast. It's it's a bridge agreement and I can provide you with pictures, et cetera, of what was and what is. Okay. Let's see, we got a motion. Oh, sorry. We had a motion to approve their request with no, no changes from last year. Is there a second? So we can get it on the table for discussion. Second. Okay, we got the second. Uh, as far as what do you need the signature from Brian or I for is just. There was a, a bridge um, next to what was Catalonia's camp yeah. in a wet area that had completely rotted that we had put in for a vast grant for um, to redeck it to make it safe so nobody fell through it and we completed that this past weekend um, and wondering if somebody will sign off on it. Why would we sign it? It's not our right away. Say that again. It's not our right away. It's been my understanding that we have to get permission from the landowner, not a right of way. And we're not a landowner out there, to my understanding. In the town forest? Out there by Catalona's camp? Yeah. I think the village owns land out there, but we don't. Is it listed under in the town forest? I don't know. Uh, I the the village has waterhead protection land. Uh, I, actually, maybe Scott can answer. Scott's this. right there. Go hey, ahead, Scott. Um, yeah, Mark's camp. Um, apparently it was on village property and I'm not sure how far out the village property goes to cover that bridge. I know the bridge and thanks for repairing it. It was a mess. Um, so looking at the property lines, you know, I don't, I just don't have it in front of me. So I'm not really clear on where the village land ends for the reservoir and uh, where Mark's old camp was not really quite clear of it heads as far out as the bridge. So without that, I don't know, but um, in case it does come back to the village, I don't want to burn up a lot of people's time. Bobby, what exactly do you need in case this becomes a village issue? It's just a, it's an agreement that VAST has us hand out to our landowners um, for bridge agreements and also permission slips to travel on the property. Okay. Um, standard, my, standard stuff. Yeah. So my take on this is, you know, maybe just hook up with Meredith and um, Brian to see who actually owns the property. Okay. 
and if it's village, we'll take it up at our next meeting. And if you need it quicker, maybe we can do an emergency meeting for you and get it worked through. Okay. But um, yeah, if you can provide Meredith the, the detail and what you need. Sorry to see you get bounced around like this, but yeah. It's all right. <laughs> She's used to it. Yeah. <laughs> so a motion to sign off on it if it is on town property. Can we do that? Yeah, we could do that. On. That's my motion. Okay, well, we have a motion a second right now on the floor to approve their request for access to highways and lands, town lands, same as last year. Okay. Is Bobby, any are you... I was just going to ask, is there any further discussion on that motion? Yeah, Bobby, are you planning on um, uh, grooming the perimeter trail on Mill Park again this year? Oh, more. we're happy to do that. Um, we're going to need, at one point, I believe, I think Rob Rodriguez is here. I'm going to have him chime in on this. I don't think we did it last year because, Rob, are you there? He is here. He's here. I can ask him to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, yes go ahead, Rob. So we can groom the, I think in the past, we basically groomed the walking path around the park. Uh, so the issue we have right now is there's now gates that don't allow us to, to get, if you, where the playground is and the big boat, we have to open that gate to get the groomer through to actually get access to the walking path. Uh, so we're more than happy to groom it, but we got to have that gate open. Or we have to, uh, maybe I should say, we have to have either someone open it for us when we need to go through, or we need to have a key so we can open it when we need to go through, or it just needs to stay open all the time. It, I don't know what you guys want to do, but one of those three options would have to happen for us to do it. So okay. I think we'll probably have you get in touch with Lisa Cruz uh, to coordinate when, and we'll see, uh, but yeah, I think that probably we can arrange to have uh, somebody from Public Works or Lisa down there to open the gates when you want to, when you're going to. At your midnight. <laughs> yeah, the only problem is we groom a lot. Of, I mean, we typically groom after dark so that if a, if we meet someone on the trail, they can see us coming. So it's not uncommon us for be, for us to be out there at midnight, one, two, three, four, so in the morning. So it's, it's, it's at it odd seems, hours. I think it seems quite reasonable for you guys just to have a key to that gate. I don't expect you to be down there ripping the groomer up. <laughs> is, is there a re reason why we couldn't have the gate open during the winter season? I'm not, I, I don't necessarily know that we need to solve it here, but you know, Lisa and Brian and yeah. Rob and no, Bobby. No problem. Yeah, we'll be able to take care of it. Uh, well, I think we can handle this one pretty, pretty easily. If they're willing to do it uh, if it's possible. Uh, it's really appreciated, especially this year. We're looking for more, you know, outdoor options for kids and cross country skiing. That's a really easy one. So, anyway, that's all. Sorry to prolong it. Is there any other discussion on the with the motion on the floor as far as allowing access? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? And what's the board's pleasure? if that bridge is on town property uh, about authorizing either Brian or myself to sign. Yeah, I'll make that motion again. Okay, we have the motion. Do we have the second? Second. The motion, second, any discussion? Do we have any property that might possibly be on? What do you mean? Uh, is there any probability that we own any land that that bridge could be on? Yeah. Yeah. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Congratulations, Bobby. Thank you for yep. grooming around the ball field. Hopefully, hopefully we'll have a lot of snow. Well, well, we want a lot of snow. You guys can do what you want. 
So it's I'll be in touch, Bobby, and we'll get the exact location of that bridge pinned down, and I'll help you with jurisdiction on whether it's town or village. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. The uh, cut feasibility study. Yep. So uh, the Wild Fiber Net is going to be receiving the presentation of uh, a feasibility study that they commissioned, uh, and uh, folks are invited to attend. Uh, you mm -hmm. got an invitation by email earlier, and uh, this is serving as kind of additional notice. Okay, it's more of an FYI. Yeah. If you want to know what's happening as far as a possibility with small fiber net CUD, uh, it's uh, you realize it's a snapshot of one splice of possibility. There are a lot of players, but uh, it's a good way to get an understanding of, of one end of where we're trying to go and what the possibilities are. Of, of achieving it. There are a lot of players and uh, it's kind of like roller derby. So we'll see what happens. Uh, before we enter into executive session, do you want to brief the board on the Evergreen Cemetery Stone? Yes. Pulling up the message, but we received a message today uh, from our attorney uh, providing the advice that we had sought about um, the the headstone uh, that the family is asking to remove from Evergreen Ledge. Um, you know, they say that there is no definitive answer on this. Uh, there, there is no statute or case law that provides an answer a definitive answer on headstone ownership and control. Um, so there, there's no easy out for this one. We don't really know whether it's our headstone or their headstone. Um, but there is a reasonable basis to uh, treat headstones as personal property and therefore the subject to the control of the uh, the heirs of the individual who purchased it. So we can proceed with uh, allowing them to remove the headstone. The advice is that we uh, do what we can to obtain uh, proof that the deceased passed away in Maine and is interred there and uh, that the uh, relocation of the headstone is consistent with the wishes of the deceased and her heirs. Uh, so basically we should seek to obtain an affidavit from the family uh, that again that the, the deceased is actually in Maine uh, and not here in Johnson. Um, Second, uh, we've got the question of what to do with the plot. Um, and, and that's kind of up for grabs also of if nobody's interred there, um, then it's their property and nobody's interred there. They've suggested that they would be willing to donate it to a needy person on our recommendation if we ever recommended somebody uh, receive the plot. Um, but that's kind of a, a future question uh, of, of what's our comfort level with possibly giving that plot away. Uh, we have no reason to believe that somebody's interred there, but we don't have any great proof that no one, that, you know, that that's definitely the case. I guess we'll find out if we give it away and they dig the grave and there's somebody there. Yeah. Oh God, Mike! <laughs> you don't even want to wish that. <laughs> so we can cross that particular bridge when we come to it. When we get there, hopefully we're all gone by the time that happens. I thought that Duncan had told us once when we were when we hired him to do some grave 
um, cleaning that there's a way to tell if the soil mm -hmm. has yeah. a certain amount, amount of certainty. We could peel back the sod. Yeah. And uh, we can have a reasonable determination that whether uh, the soil was disturbed or not. Uh, that's a lot easier to tell with a casket burial than with somebody's ashes. Oh. Okay. Um, so our guarantee that no one's buried there is not very good. Um, the request you know, is coming from the daughter, though, correct? Yes. So the daughter has a pretty good idea where her mother's from. The, the daughter probably knows where her mother is buried. We're going to get the affidavits anyway, uh, so it's no big deal. And what, what you talked about with the sod business, that was a suggestion I made way back when, when we had that other issue with the sergeants. And uh, to take a sod cutter and to, to go over an area, and you could easily see if there'd been a, a, a grave dug there. Uh, all you have to do is take a probe, too, a skinny probe, and just probe the area. Uh, but I think the affidavits are going to cover us for any liability or anything like that. Who are the heirs? Uh, it's Kitty. I gotta think. I gotta look up her name. Well, my question is, is she the sole heir? No, I've got some, uh, I've got a grandson and a brother. Well, how many, start out, how many kids did this person have? I believe just two children. All right. And those, and are both of those children alive? Yes. And so I think you should treat this like it was a probate matter. You know, you, you uh, uh, get agreement of both the, uh, of both of the get an affidavit not from one but everyone who is a a direct line descendant of you know you know if you've got a uh, a daughter you don't need to go to grandchildren of, of that but you I think you shouldn't accept an affidavit of of just one child if there's more than if there's more than one person so, involved. Uh, so Doug's proposal is. Two affidavits, one from the daughter, one from the son, uh, both attesting that they support uh, moving the headstone to the gravesite in Maine. And that would be the two heirs. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then giving that plot to the town. That's all part of it. Well, that could be a request, but we can't require it of them. Well, they said they were going to do it. Yeah. Well, the daughter said. Well. She, the person died in Maine? That, I believe that they died in Maine, yes. And did they probate their, was it an estate probated? It doesn't appear so. They don't have, they have not been able to obtain good records for us. In, in Vermont, in Vermont, a, uh, you know, uh, real property can be conveyed by the uh, uh, heirs uh, subject to the, the, the debt of, of the uh, estate. Um, I don't know what the rule is in Maine. So how long ago did the person die? Uh, I can check, no, I can't get it offhand, but quite a while ago. If you're if you're outside, if they have the same rule in Maine, and you're outside the statute of limitations, then the an heirs deed would work on that for to convey that property. Uh, well, you're conveying Vermont property anyway, so an heirs deed would would work to convey that. It'd be a death certificate too for that. Do is there a death certificate? They have not been able to provide one to us. Oh, come on. <laughs> that, that's ridiculous. I wouldn't jump too far without anything, without a basic proof. 
Me neither. And you you might tell them to produce it. Go ahead, excuse me. What are we requesting of them? We've got uh, an affidavit from each individual. You want a death certificate? Yes. What? Why? First and foremost. Just me, it's probably very obvious, but why? It proves that they died in Maine. Well, it proves the, the woman who owns the plot is dead and her heirs have the legal authority to move the stone. The death certificate wouldn't give us the, that the heirs have the legal authority. It would really just prove that the woman died. Yes. And we don't have any doubt that she's dead. Well, what's the problem with producing a death certificate? How do we know she's dead? <laughs> Well, because her daughter's telling us. I mean, I don't think that we don't need to be crazy about this, do we? I mean, you really think that she's just like wanting to play games with her living mother? No, not necessarily. But to tie up all loose ends, I would think we would need a death certificate. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I think Doug agrees with me. Yeah, I think so too. Scott, I don't know what you got to add. <laughs> Um, a little bit. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting to know more and more about um, certificates. And there is um, pretty crucial information that's sensitive as far as um, social security numbers, reason for death, which is a medical privacy issue. There's a lot of stuff on that um, that would have to be secured if the town was going to ask for it. I totally get where Mike is coming from, but um, just remember there's extremely sensitive information. It can be blacked out. Okay. Yeah. We just, it seems like we make everything just way more complicated than it needs to be. Just yeah. have the, the, the heirs sign the affidavit. And we do have a recommendation from our attorney that what would be sufficient would be an affidavit from each of the heirs that they are the sole heirs and that this is their wishes. Honestly, if this was my parent, my parents' tombstone, I would have moved it without asking the Cemetery Association of the town. I mean, it's just... What I say last time, that's what I'd have done. I don't know. I, I wasn't here when you discussed it last Oh, you weren't here, were you? Sorry. But um, anyway, let's just keep this simple. The affidavit is is the ticket for us, and let's leave it at that. Well, they're basically attesting in that affidavit that she's dead, and so of, of uh, under threat of perjury, uh, they would have to be truthful. So that's fine with me. Maybe they can tell us where she died, what she died of, what hospital. You know, they might provide details. And if they can provide details, I don't know why, you know, that type of thing can be verified from medical records too, usually. Basically, Nat, my opinion on this is that you get a death certificate because everything they've talked about is really sketchy. Okay. 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 Well, that, there's some background there then that, that I don't know. Okay. I think we need a death certificate first thing out the gate before we go any any further. Okay, I think we're here and we do want the death certificate and the affidavit. All right. So affidavits from each of the heirs and a death certificate. Yeah. Right. All right. And we do have a uh, graveyard <laughs> woman that goes into graveyards in the middle of the night looking for gravestones. <laughs> I, I won't identify who she is. <laughs> it's not Linda. <laughs> okay. Is there any other business before entering into executive session? If not, I would entertain a motion. We got to talk about the general uh, information items or anything. We can. 
We do have stuff here, you know, we probably should discuss it. All right. What are you talking about here now? Well, there's a letter, a premium uh, MVP 2021 premium updates, rural community transportation request okay. for 2820, the Mall County Planning Commission uh, for 1877. I mean, this is budget items. Yep, go ahead. What do you want to talk about? Anything. Well, this is all going to come up during our budget discussions in the next couple of months. Okay, and then drop that. Then we'll talk about information items then. All right. So uh, we got the letter for the MVP 2021 premium rates. Um, I haven't, I would hesitate to uh, really report on that off the top of my head right now. I'm not, I, I can provide copy of the, of the rates to everybody, but uh, we usually base our decisions on Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, uh, again, that's going to be a discussion point at the next. Yeah, this is, we typically do this with uh, the letter from Sandy Ello is uh, request and comments at Plot Road uh, needs to be repaved. Um, as you recall, Plot Road was a target for uh, this summer. We had applied for a. Uh, class three paving grant uh, due to the state's COVID-19 and budgetary issues. Uh, approval for that got delayed. Uh, and the most recent update, I believe I sent you a copy in your email last week, uh, the board or the, the VTRAN's decision has been to suspend uh, paving grants for the time being. So they're not granting any paving grants, but they did award us a little bit more than our typical uh, uh, annual road main, uh, road uh, state contribution to roads and uh, for maintenance items. So we do have a little bit more money, even though we didn't receive the, the grant. So my feeling is that in the spring between our the money that we would be spending out of pocket on this financial year and next financial year and the additional state aid we received i think we'll be able to pay for uh the paving that we wanted to do next which was plot road and i think overhill um but i'd have to go back into my my transportation notes to get the two to be certain on the two uh, we're going to have to do a little bit of, you know, uh, examining our, our budget on this, but I think that we're going to be able to afford those two. If not, and we have to pick one, Plot Road would be my priority project. Very bad. I was just on it today and I was like, whoa. <laughs> there was also some, and uh, Sandy comments on it, there was some, um, uh, with restoration and work on a house up there, they had crossed the road with a couple culverts that uh, we anticipated paving over. Um, so they may have, they, it could be that we're gonna have to do some work on fill in that area in the meantime. Yeah, it, it, there's some huge, huge ruts. Yeah, no, it, Plot Road, we know it's in bad shape. It was targeted for paving. Yeah. And yeah, the program just got suspended. So we didn't get the money to do the paving. Yeah, now I get it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, it's my first target for when we do have money to spend. And uh, I think that, I think that we don't really have any choice but to pay for it out of pocket. Um, because I don't think it can wait until the program is started up again. Anything else? Move well, we go into executive session to discuss employee, comp employee compensation as allowed by 1 BSA 313A3. We have a motion. Do we have a second? And Get the second. Any more discussion? And I need All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And Close. Show us an executive session at 947. Thank you, everyone. So we're out of 
executive <laughs> session at 10.06. <laughs> I would at this point entertain a motion to compensate an employee. Make a motion that we compensate with a stipend, an extra $100 uh, week for Jason Whitehill in his capacity as the public works supervisor. Acting. Interim, public. acting public works supervisor. You got a motion? Do we have a second? Okay. Second. A second, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify saying aye. Aye. Those opposed? The ayes have it. Is there any other business before this board? If not, please show us adjourned at 10.07. <laughs> <laughs>